So welcome to today's webinar. Uh, we're really happy to have Dr. Priya Kashnani here today with us. Uh, Dr. Kashnani is the Chief of the, of the Division of Medical Genetics, Department of Pediatrics, and Director of the YT and Alice Chen Center for Genomic Research, which has a focus on developing new therapies for rare genetic disorders at D Duke University. She holds certification from the American Board of Medical Genetics and the American Board of Biochemical Genetics. Throughout her career, Dr. Kashnani's primary focus has been uh, the translation of laboratory science into a clinical arena, especially in the area of such therapeutic interventions such as enzyme replacement therapy, gene therapy, and small molecules. She has really propelled the translational research program at Duke with a T1 to T4 impact, really meaning moving things from bench to bedside and back to the bench with further advances towards the diagnosis, treatment and management of patients with rare diseases, including those with Pompeii disease. Dr. Kishnani has built an interdisciplinary team at Duke University and really has contributed to the approval of drugs such as Myozyme uh, for treatment for Pompeii disease. And she's contributed to clinical trials and also newborn screening in the US. We welcome Dr. Kishnani today as we're really wanting to learn more about Pompeii disease and early diagnosis. Currently in Canada, the only neuromuscular condition that is screened at birth is spinal muscular atrophy. And actually that's not even the case for every single province and territory. We're working towards that. We also know that there are treatments for Pompeii disease and that there can be value in an earlier and timely diagnosis. So with that, we'd love to learn more about the insights around an early and timely diagnosis of Pompeii disease. Over to you and thank you again for joining. Uh, thank you so much for the very kind um, introduction. And it is my pleasure to give you some insights into Pompeii disease. Uh, since the advent of newborn screening. And I was actually asked to also uh, discuss a few other aspects which I'm gonna try and do during the call today. So these are uh, my uh, disclosures. And again, for this audience, um, I think all of you do know that Pompe disease is caused due to the enzyme deficiency acid alpha glucosidase or GAA and that it is a continuum of disease involvement, but at one end of the disease spectrum is those that we call infantile Pompeii disease, uh, which presents really in the first few months of life, as you see it in Canada, but for us in the US, we see it really in the first days of life, in fact, even at birth, uh, because of newborn screening. And the feature that um, makes this uh, form or this subtype a really rapidly progressive is because of the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and death within the first year of life. And then we have the rest of the disease spectrum, which is every patient with Pompe disease that is not infantile Pompe disease. So those who do not have a hypertrophic cardiomyopathy in the first year of life, um, but can have you know disease progression from the first year to upwards of the sixth decade of life. So this is really the way I think about the clinical course or the natural course of Pompeii disease, which really is a progression from healthy muscle to irreversible muscle damage. So if you see here is the healthy muscle and each of these brown circles represents a muscle fiber. Um, in yellow is the lysosome. Inside the lysosome is the enzyme acid alpha glucosidase. And so this is in healthy muscle. As you have the enzyme deficiency, and then as the glycogen which builds up, the lysosome starts ballooning. There's some glycogen that goes outside the lysosome. And if you see below it, the muscle is now not looking as healthy. And then over a course of time, um, there is a state of irreversible muscle damage, um, as you see to the extreme right, where uh, the muscle fibers are all fibrotic. There's a lot of damage that has occurred. And if you see it under the microscope, this is what you see, a, a lot of disarray of the muscle fibers. The nuclei um, are more marginated to the periphery. And this is what we don't want in our patients when we diagnose them. We want to diagnose them in this earlier stage 
or the pre-symptomatic stage where we can impact them the best. So when we had done the initial work on Pompeii disease, this is in collaboration with Beth Thurberg, you know, who is a wonderful pathologist, is we tried to look at it as early stage and further staging of it. So when the glycogen sits inside the lysosome, usually the rest of the muscles of the cell looks healthy and mitochondria, which are the energy houses of the cell, look normal and the patient has a mild myopathy. As the disease progresses, there's much more glycogen inside the lysosome. Some of it has come outside the lysosome as I've shown you. Now the mitochondria are also looking abnormal. The patient is experiencing more myopathy and at the level of the biopsy, you're seeing more of the fiber destruction. And then there is the end stage or the final stage, you know, where most of the lysosome material has gone out into the cytosol. There's a complete loss of the muscle fiber structure. And this is really what we call that final stage or stage five. Now, it's important to remember that these different stages can exist within the same muscle um, in the different muscle fibers of it. So now when we think about what is the clinical cause of untreated infantile Pompe disease, and this is what we had published in 2006, is the first signs and symptoms are really noticed at a mean age of about 2.7 months. The diagnosis is at a mean age of about six months. And then about a month later, the baby ends up on a ventilator. And then by about 12 months of age, the baby succumbs. So it's a very rapidly progressive um, course for the infantile form of Pompe disease. And really what has to be recognized is that these first signs and symptoms, if we moved it earlier towards, you know, with the help of newborn screening, we can completely change this now also because of the fact that we have enzyme replacement therapy um, and a way to manage patients with Pompe disease. So how do the cases really come to us clinically for infantile Pompeii is we often think of it as a pulmonary presentation with upper respiratory infections or a chest x-ray is done which just shows massive cardiomegaly or the patient presents because of um, a pneumonia, respiratory insufficiency and the first time we see them is they're already requiring ventilator support. They can have what we call a neurological presentation where the parents really start expressing a concern at around three months of age. You know, there's a lot of hypotonia, there's developmental delay. Often there's a diagnosis of spinomuscular atrophy. Sometimes a diagnosis of a mitochondrial disease is considered, or sometimes parents report a loss of previously achieved milestones. They can also present with the GI format, like, you know, with failure to thrive or with reflux or with feeding difficulty. Other ways are cardiac, where there is a cardiac uh, arrest because of an anesthesia for an elective surgery. Um, it could be that you know an echocardiogram was done and it started to show a hypertrophic heart. It also could be because of a heart rhythm uh, presentation, and this could also be life-threatening for the baby. And then there can be the genetic presentation because of the family history of an affected sibling, um, or the family history of a sibling death with a large heart and storage material that was identified at autopsy. These are, of course, in the older times, you know, where um, an appropriate workup was not done. We have much more awareness now because there's a treatment for Pompe disease. So now the question is for late onset Pompe disease, what was our understanding at the time when enzyme therapy was first approved? I think we thought about patients like, you know, with their first complaints at about 28 years of age, um, at which point a diagnosis could have been made. Um, about a decade later, they have this progressive muscle weakness. They have problems going up and down the stairs. Um, around that time, you know, they start progressing. They now have a need for an ambulatory device. And then these same patients, you know, who are having these motor difficulties can also have difficulties with breathing. And then about two decades since the time of diagnosis, many of them require ventilator support. So the idea is that this is what we knew. And I want you to think about this as we talk about newborn screening. And then if you think about how the clinical manifestations are, 
can you see my screen fully? Yes. Okay. Um, some of the key manifestations, you know, are a gait abnormality, a proximal limb girdle kind of muscle weakness. Uh, patients can have breathing difficulties. They can wake up with a morning headache because of the carbon dioxide retention. They can present because of musculoskeletal features like a scoliosis or a lumbar lordosis, uh, low back pain. These are all the different ways in which a patient uh, can present. Let me see why this is not advancing. Yes. And there's a lot of variability that we see in these patients, and they can present anywhere, as I said, from the first year of life to um, adult uh, presentation. The other aspect to remember is that in Canada, like in the US, um, a number of patients with late onset Pompe disease have what we call this common leaky IVS plicite mutation, which if you look at the literature, has often said that it has a milder clinical course. They usually present later in life, um, but I'm gonna try and show you a different picture since the advent of newborn screening. So another feature that we have started to recognize is it's not just a limb girdle um, disease or condition, uh, and it's not only a condition where there's you know, pulmonary involvement and limb girdle involvement, we're learning that there can be tongue weakness, there can be blood vessel involvement, there can be cardiac manifestations even in late onset Pompe disease, primarily in the form of uh, heart rhythm disturbances. They can have smooth muscle involvement. And so with bladder and bowel incontinence, they can have GI manifestations in the form of difficulty uh, with eating. They can have GE reflux uh, kind of symptoms as well. And also one of the presenting features could be eyelid muscle weakness. So over time, we've also learned that there are certain variants or certain genetic mutations, which are more common in certain ethnic backgrounds. We also learned over time, as I said to you, that the late onset patients with Pompe disease of Caucasian um, origin have this common leaky IVS splicite mutation. We've also learned that some patients can have what we know is a pseudo deficiency, which means that when we were to measure the enzyme activity, um, it comes back as low, the, but the patient really doesn't have Pompe disease. This is what we call pseudo deficiency. As the term suggests, pseudo is not real. And this particular genetic change is seen at a higher frequency in the Asian populations. So again, a tip off that if we're doing newborn screening, we have to think about this. And if you just get low enzyme activity that does not equal Pompe disease, one has to try and understand the genetics um, you know, before we initiate treatment. So that brings me to the diagnosis. And often we do this through enzyme testing in a clinical scenario. And in the good old days, um, it was not on a blood spot or a blood-based assay. What we did was more on skin fibroblasts or on muscle biopsy. But today we have the luxury of an earlier way to diagnose or an easier way to diagnose is through doing enzyme testing on a dried blood spot. We can also look under the microscope for pathology. And whilst we say it should not be a first line evaluation, very often in a busy neuromuscular clinic where one is thinking of many other diagnoses, um, you know, a muscle biopsy is done. The take home message here is that if a muscle biopsy is done, then a normal histology does not exclude Pompe disease, especially for late onset, because it depends on the site of the biopsy. It rather should be confirmed if we're really suspecting it through enzyme testing um, before we say that someone does not have Pompe disease. Another important way is to look at biomarkers. So CPK is a breakdown, you know, it's released from muscle. And so if there's muscle damage, you have an increase in the CK. However, CK could be normal in some patients with late onset Pompe disease. So once again, that needs to be remembered. And then there is um, a urine biomarker called HEX4, which is a breakdown product of glycogen. And um, this could be, this is usually elevated in infantile Pompe, could be normal in some patients with late onset 
uh, Pompe disease. So again, as part of the diagnostic workup, my messaging again is molecular diagnosis is very important because also of the concern for the serodeficiency allele, but also in uh, situations, you know, especially for infantile, if we're trying to find out what the mutations are to determine whether we want to do immune modulation, which is a way of managing the immune system when treating with enzyme therapy. Um, so these factors need to be considered. So the take home message is that if your physician has made a diagnosis through enzyme testing, it really is important to also get um, mutation analysis done because it also informs you know, other family members. It also helps with management of the case. It also helps out sometimes in the scenario, as I told you, if it's a serodeficiency and so it's just the enzyme activity is low, but the patient does not truly have Pompe disease. So I want to move forward and say that in 2006 and 2010 respectively, alglucosidase alpha or myozyma lumosyme was approved as a treatment for Pompe disease. And so there's a lot of lessons that we learned from enzyme replacement therapy and beyond, including the factors that impact the outcome, the natural history that's now emerging, uh, the limitations and challenges of ERT, our next generation therapies and new therapies on the horizon, and of course, you know, the lessons of newborn screening, which I'm going to focus on. So a question I'm often asked is now that you've treated babies with infantile Pompeii, what do they look like? And really what I want to point out is whilst, you know, we've improved survival, while we've improved ventilator-free survival, we've also learned that there are sequelae of the disease that continue. And some of these could also be related to the timing of when enzyme therapy was uh, initiated. Like for instance, um, you know, the inability to walk or um, to have continued motor deficits, this is more likely in the setting of someone who was treated later. Uh, they can also have more of the challenges with respiratory insufficiency, et cetera. But we're also seeing that it is multisystemic in nature. And besides the heart and the skeletal muscle, there's a lot more involvement in Pompe disease. Now, what have we learned about late onset Pompe disease? And again, my take home message from each of these is that a large part of the, of the delay in diagnosis or the delay in initiation of treatment is what results in some of the limitations that we are facing with enzyme therapy. But of course, next generation enzyme therapy is only gonna make things better, right? If you have early diagnosis plus um, an enzyme that works more efficiently. So this is for late onset Pompe disease. And what was learned is that when we followed these patients um, from these four different countries, uh, what's called the STIG study, what was seen is that the mean age of diagnosis was about 41 years. The mean age at enzyme therapy start was about 45 years. So there was a delay from diagnosis to treatment. And then what was seen is that the muscle strength as assessed by the MRC scale you know, showed stability. Um, but what we also saw was that the forced vital capacity and the six minute walk test, which were all done over time, what it really showed us is that when you follow these patients for a period of about five years or more, overall, there was a stability um, in the forced vital capacity. Uh, the six minute walk test showed the best therapeutic enzyme therapy effect. But what we were seeing was that an initial positive effect and then more of a stabilization for many of these patients. So that brings us to the point of the factors which impact enzyme therapy. I think we already, I already showed you that when muscle damage has occurred, it's problematic you know, to reverse that muscle damage. What about if you start them early? Does that make a difference? Uh, what about the immune response to the enzyme therapy? These are all important factors. So I'm gonna show you a few quick uh, slides. So this is showing you that if you've got a lot of skeletal muscle damage at baseline, like in this situation, then the response to enzyme therapy is gonna be very poor. Here, what you're seeing under the electron microscope 
each of these big circles here is actually the lysosome. And here there's glycogen inside the lysosomes. So as long as the glycogen is inside the lysosome, as the enzyme therapy enters into the lysosome, it can clear the glycogen. But if it's already left and is outside the lysosome, there's so much damage to the muscle that the enzyme therapy is likely not to have an impact in this particular set of muscle fibers. So now when we look at this in a different way, if you look under the microscope and you see that someone you know, who was started on therapy when they were just under six months of age, uh, which we in the past thought was very good, you can see there's a lot of damage to the muscle that has already occurred. All this whitish um, uh, muscle fibers is that they were previously filled with glycogen and the way we've stained it, um, you know, there's um, washing out of the glycogen, but it's telling us that this response is not really good. If you started someone at a younger age, all this material in the pink. So these are muscle fibers, which are looking pretty healthy. But if you look on this side, there's all this purple material. This is the glycogen. So the point to make is that some muscle fibers are healthy, some are not as healthy. But if you start at a very young age, what you can appreciate is that these muscle fibers look so healthy when you initiate therapy early. So this is the message. You start early, you have less damage, you can impact better with enzyme therapy. So then the other one is the immune system. And maneuvering the immune system is very important. This is work that our group has done for a period of time now. I think many of you will be familiar with the terminology CRIM, which is cross-reactive immunological material. And just to keep that very simple, what you can see here is that this is markers. So, you know, this is in a normal individual, if I was to look at how the enzyme is broken down in the body, we actually see, you know, these kind of um, uh, markers, you know, which tells us that the enzyme is being efficiently broken down. Now in someone who is making some enzyme with Pompe disease, but not fully, they are called what's called CRIM positive, as you can see that they're not really going into the mature form of the enzyme. But then if you don't make any of the enzyme inside the body, that's the most extreme phenotype, what we call CRIM negative. So here you see absolutely no band pattern. So these are the patients that we are most worried about, because if you were to give the enzyme to these individuals, their body has not seen it before. Remember this protein is not there. So it starts viewing the enzyme, the glucosidase alpha as foreign, and they typically mount an immune response. So we clearly showed this by showing that babies who were CRIM negative, um, as compared to those who were CRIM positive, you know, mounted these antibody titers, which you can see by these high numbers, like running in the 400,000 range, compared to CRIM positive babies. And this really then, impacted the outcome. What you're seeing on this um, Kaplan-Meier survival curve, as we call it, is what's in red is the CRIM positive, and this shows survival. What is here is CRIM negative, and it's really showing that if you are CRIM negative, then despite enzyme therapy, you're not going to do well, and you're going to end up either on invasive ventilation or the baby is going to be deceased. So we took that to the next level and said, some of our CRIM positive babies are also not doing well. So when we started comparing them, what we recognized that there is a subset of CRIM positive babies, about one third of them, that also make this immune response or antibodies similar to someone who is CRIM negative. And if you see uh, what's in red is someone who is CRIM positive, but has made antibodies and what's in black is someone who's CRIM negative, who we know make high antibodies. And if you compare them, they are behaving very similar to each other. So another lesson that was learned, which then took us to what do we do to the immune system to make this work. So this is how we look at the immune system. This is the enzyme um, GAA or the recombinant GAA. And as we inject it into the body, it is broken down into these small greener, smaller pieces of protein. 
which are taken up by specific cells in the body called the APCs or the antigen presenting cells. So antigen is like the enzyme, right? So once these are taken up by the antigen presenting cells, there is a whole cascade of immune response that is created. And at the end is the individual may make antibodies to the enzyme. So if we were to use certain agents to act on the immune system so that this whole cascade of events does not occur, can we do right by our patients with Pompe disease? And so that's what we did. This is what we call immune modulation. So we looked at it in the most severe end of the disease spectrum. So that's crum negative babies. We treated them with this medications that I talked about, which is a very short course, is relatively safe, and the risk benefit ratio definitely is in favor of using this agent, these agents. And then you just continue with the enzyme therapy alone, or in some instances, more of this uh, medications are needed. So this really resulted in very improved outcomes in the children with Pompeii, who otherwise would have died um, despite enzyme therapy. But if you gave them this immune modulation, they did well. And this then translated really into the FDA and the EMA changing the package insert recommendations, uh, saying that CRIM should be done, CRIM status should be done in infantile Pompeii. And if the baby is CRIM negative, then you know some kind of immune modulation should be initiated. So that is the second problem, which I told you. One is the stage of the disease. The second is the antibody response to the enzyme. The third is the lowest hanging fruit. What if I can diagnose my baby or my patient early? How does that help? So this is data from the Pompe registry, which shows that babies with infantile Pompe disease have about a 1.4 month delay from when they have symptoms to when the diagnosis is made. And for those with late onset Pompe disease, I want you to look at this very carefully. These are children with late onset disease. So anywhere from one to 12 years of age. And what you can see is that the diagnostic delay for them is about 12.6 years. So when we think about newborn screening, it's not just for infantile, it's also to capture these children with late onset Pompe disease who may have had manifestations, but were just being passed off as being lazy children or just having some kind of non-specific developmental delay. So the role of newborn screening, I think, was pioneered first in Taiwan. And I think the lessons that were learned was that once they initiated newborn screening, they were able to confirm or compare it to those babies who were diagnosed via newborn screening versus those who were clinically detected. And what they saw was that if someone was diagnosed through newborn screening, they had 100% survival at 24 months, whereas someone who was clinically detected and identified, the survival was lower, it was 89%. But now if we raise the bar and say if it is that not only is the baby alive, but is also free of invasive ventilation, you can see that there's 100% invasive ventilator-free survival for those picked up through screening and treated early versus just 67% or two thirds that are alive and ventilator free if you were to diagnose them clinically. So this was the first set of learnings that was seen. But then I think what was also seen was that days matter. And I'm going to show you this. This is from another group in Taiwan. And I just want you to look here is that they looked at an, a cohort of babies who were treated at a younger age as compared to those who were identified by newborn screening, but were treated just about two weeks later. And you can see here is that it makes a lot of difference. The age of independent walking was much earlier in those who were initiated even two weeks early as compared to others. And also the biomarkers or you know this marker of muscle damage, CK, was actually returning to normal at two years of age, doing much better in those babies treated earlier as compared to those who may have been just treated about two weeks later. So now the other aspect is the role of newborn screening for late onset Pompe disease. And so in Taiwan, 
they had 13 newborns with late onset Pompe disease as part of their newborn screening program. And these children had a four year follow up period. They were followed up every three to six months with a physical exam and also some kind of blood work that was done. And out of these 13 newborns, four of these babies were started on therapy anywhere from as young as one and a half months of age to three years of age. Now, this is late onset Pompeii. We're not talking about infantile Pompeii. And so they definitely recognized that, you know, as I had mentioned earlier, these children were being lost, um, you know, if they were clinically um, picked up. Um, because if the parents said that my child is a bit slower, not doing as well, it was often just passed off. There was not enough suspicion for Pompeii. So this new one screening study clearly, clearly showed this. And then the group in Taiwan also showed that when they looked at the muscle biopsies <coughs> of several of these babies with late onset Pompeii disease, you can see that there is glycogen accumulation pretty early in these babies with late onset Pompeii disease. And if you were to look under the electron microscope, there's already the buildup of what we say, these autophagic vacuoles, you know, which are vacuoles that we see um, in patients with Pompeii disease, uh, because the normal process of self eating, which is called autophagy, is actually um, dysregulated in individuals with Pompeii disease. And so you see this kind of buildup so you're seeing this kind of early in even babies identified with late onset Pompe disease via newborn screening. So with all these lessons from Taiwan, newborn screening was implemented in the US in 2015. And today there are about 45 states, including our state of North Carolina that is now screening for Pompe disease. So this is excellent news because we're learning a lot what we are seeing is that the vast majority of those babies who are identified by newborn screening are those with late onset. And many of them carry this um, leaky IBS plicite mutation that I had talked to you about. So what we know right now is that the findings from the Taiwan newborn screening program is excellent. But another thing for us to remember is that the island of Taiwan has all crum positive babies, they don't see crum negative. Whereas in the US and in Canada, we see a lot of crum negative. So the idea is that we can take some of these lessons from Taiwan, but we've also got to learn from our own experience um, of how these babies are doing when they are identified by newborn screening. So we looked at those babies identified with newborn screening who were crum negative, and I'll try and show this to you very quickly. What we were able to show is that those babies who were treated at under age four weeks who were also crim negative, and when we compared them to those babies who are what we called treated between four weeks and 15 weeks, and also to the group who were treated at beyond 15 weeks of age, there were significant differences in their outcome. If you looked at the invasive ventilator-free survival, those who were picked up by newborn screening were all alive and invasive ventilator free. The numbers were less for those who were picked up anywhere beyond four weeks um, and treated you know, up to even 15 weeks and those who were treated at age later than age 15 weeks, that is. So again, another lesson that was learned. We also saw that if you diagnose early and treat early, you have even less burden of disease so the heart size is much smaller in someone uh, who's identified early. And this translates then to a normalization of the heart size much quicker and much easier than someone who's picked up late. And so that was another important message that you can normalize the heart size by 20 weeks if you uh, start them early on treatment. Oh. So the conclusions from this finding or from this study was even in the very high risk crim negative baby, if you pick them up by newborn screening, if you immune modulate them like the way I told you, and if you treat them you know, with a good dose of enzyme therapy, they actually do extremely well. So this was great proof of concept you know, to say that uh, the role of newborn screening is really important, especially in these most vulnerable babies with Pompeii disease. So, Having completed that aspect, 
What happens to those with late onset pump A disease? Because that's the vast majority of babies that we are picking up with newborn screening. And so we had met as a group and we had come up with a management algorithm for late onset pump A disease in the newborn screening setting. And what we had said that if a baby was asymptomatic, we don't need to start ERT and we just continue to evaluate them. But I think the elephant in the room is what really are we evaluating in these children? We don't know because we've never experienced late onset pump A disease in the newborn screening setting in India, uh, in, in the US. And so this was our initial experience with newborn screening um, at Duke. So as newborn screening started in the US, there were several babies that came to Duke for a second opinion. And at that point, uh, it was not surprising that all seven of them carried this common leaky IVS splicite mutation. Some of them had it on one allele, so inherited it from one parent, and the second variant was different. But in four out of seven, both of them carried this leaky IVS variant. What we found is the following. Um, I'm just going to give you a case example from here. This was a Caucasian female who was picked up by newborn screening. Her mutation analysis showed that she had that leaky IBS mutation, the C minus 32 minus 13 T2G, which is that common variant. And she also carried a second pathogenic variant. And she had had a couple of genetics evaluations and was told that things were going fine. However, the CPK levels or this marker of muscle injury was increased right since day eight of life. The echocardiogram and EKG for this baby was normal. So she was seen by the physical therapist um, at her home institution who said that there was some suggestion of a gross motor developmental delay in this child. And uh, so weekly physical therapy was initiated. We then saw this baby about a month later at Duke. And as we were looking at the biomarkers, uh, we could see that at six months of age, the biomarker had been had been consistently increased for CK, also for ASD, which is a marker also of muscle breakdown. And uh, so we said, how does this baby look? So this baby, this is what the baby looked like. And you can see that the baby is able to hold her head up. She's able to weight bear on her arms, you know, with the forearms extended. This looked pretty good. However, this is the role of the physical therapist um, when the physical therapist saw this baby and compared to a typically developing child without Pompe disease, I hope this picture tells you there are quite a few important differences. But if you don't really look very carefully, you can miss this very easily. So in a pediatrician's office, this could be missed. And so these were then described as postural findings that are different in someone with Pompe disease as compared to a typically developing child. Now, when we look at a typically developing child in this position, once again, you can see that the baby with pump A disease with late onset is doing some of the tasks, but is not like moving its legs all the way up, um, is not doing what a typically developing child is doing. And so this got us on a path of thinking and evaluation that the role of the physical therapist in the newborn screening setting is really, really important. For this particular case, her treating physician ended up starting her on enzyme therapy. This child is now, I think, close to six years of age. You could not sort her out from another child. Her biomarkers have normalized. Functionally, she's doing great. So then we did a systematic look at 20 infants diagnosed with late onset pump A disease after a positive newborn screen. And what we learned from this is that the role of a comprehensive assessment of these children with the physical therapist and of course a physical exam um, assessment, we were doing the biomarker testing, we were looking at cardiac studies, we also had a speech therapy evaluation that was done. Um, here, I'm just going to show you some of the physical therapy or postural findings that we saw. Um, they do have some gross motor features, which are very subtle and can be missed, like, you know, sitting with their hips, as you can appreciate here, 
in abduction and external rotation. So you can see that almost like in this frog-like, but sitting upwards, um, you can see that the back is not completely straight. It's what we call a posterior rounding of this back. You can see this prominence of the scapula. You can also see you know, a tightness here which tells us that they're not in this position enough and hence you know, this groove has been formed. And so these are subtle features which we found in many of our patients you know, with Pompe disease picked up by newborn screening who were late onset. And so I'm taking a very proactive view of the emerging natural history of late onset in the setting of newborn screening. Uh, this is just based on our 20 babies that we saw. We saw them at a median age of nine and a half months. Uh, about 40 of them had an increase in their biomarkers. Many of them had postural findings, as I showed you, um, you know, with the tightness of the iliotibial band. They had these positional abnormalities in a number of them. And also when they were evaluated by the speech and language pathologist, some of them had some findings of swallowing um, or of feeding difficulties, which you know otherwise could have been passed off. And so I want to remind you, as I started this talk, this is how we thought of late onset Pompe disease with the first complaints and a diagnosis at 28 years. So compared it to what I showed you, they're diagnosed right at birth. And then by a few months of age, we're seeing these increases in their biomarkers. We're also seeing some muscle findings in them which um, you know, are telling us that we need to monitor them more closely. And so we have to think about Pompe disease very differently today. So again, reminding us, this is from the clinical trials. Here is um, muscle biopsy and the purplish material is glycogen. So here in the above, you can see there's less of it. You do much better. If there's more of it, even with enzyme therapy, you don't do as well. And so I want to remind you that this is from a baby with late onset Pompe disease. Uh, what's on the extreme left is normal control. This is a 13 month old with late onset Pompe disease who was identified via newborn screening. The point I wanna make here is that there is already damage that has occurred at 13 months of age. And this baby was already on therapy for two months. So I think we've got to think carefully We've got to advocate for Pompe disease on newborn screening. We've got to evaluate our babies with late onset Pompe disease very carefully. And now we're also seeing that the frequency of Pompe disease is much more than what we had previously thought. What we had thought prior to newborn screening was that the estimated frequency was about one in 40,000 births. But today with our studies across the globe, also through the US, um, and through newborn screening platforms, that the frequency of Pompe disease is twice as much as what we had previously known about. So clearly, there is that other role of newborn screening. And then in closing, because our end goal is to write by our babies, if we start here, when there is some amount of damage, this is what we can clear. If we start later, this is what we are dealing with. If we start here, which is the goal of newborn screening, this is what we can achieve. And then in closing, if we started right in utero or before the baby is born, we won't even have this to deal with. And right at birth, the babies already had clearance of glycogen. Yeah. And so I really want to um, acknowledge that this progress over time has been a partnership between Duke foundation, industry, patients, caregivers, and a global community of physician scientists, including many from Canada. Um, our team is um, growing, you know, and there's so much enthusiasm in terms of um, learnings that we have got, um, also from physicians from around the world. And with that, I would like to end um, and really um, acknowledge uh, and thank um, all of you for your time and uh, for giving me this opportunity to present. 
Wonderful. Thank you so much for a very clearly delivered uh, presentation and information on Pompeii disease and early diagnosis. Um, I should mention that, you know, at MDC, as we, as I uh, mentioned to you earlier, uh, are very strong proponents for an earlier and timely diagnosis. And I think today's presentation really um, highlights its importance. What I'd like to do is just turn to some questions. I actually received a few questions on this. While Canada doesn't have um, Pompeii included in its newborn screening program, there was news about last fall that Isla Bashir was the first child in the world to be treated for Pompeii disease in utero. Can you speak to that case a little bit more as I know you were involved? Absolutely. Um, I mean, it gives me goosebumps when I think about this because this is the power of collaboration. And this was, um, you know, during COVID when all this was going on. And um, Dr. Um, Chakrabarti, um, because I've helped with the care of the other two children in that family, um, the family knew us well. And when they were pregnant, um, you know, it was the same crim negative infantile Pompeii that was uh, identified. And at this time, you know, we were collaborating with the group at uh, UCSF. And there's a younger faculty member of mine, uh, Jennifer Cohen, who's very interested in the intrauterine um, or early treatment approach. And so this became a network of participants. At the center of this was um, the family. And, um, you know, we had an initial discussion with them, talked to them about the risks and the benefits, um, the potential that if we treated really, really early, like even before the baby was born, um, maybe we could help with a better clinical outcome, but also um, suppress or reduce that immune response, which I was talking about to you, uh, we, what we see in CRIM negative. And so um, it was really... Uh, an exciting collaboration and the results I think speak for themselves. And I wish Dr. Chakrabarti was here to give us updates on uh, baby Isla. But from what I know is that she's doing extremely well. Very good, we hope so. Um, another question that's come up is for those that have been involved with advocating for an earlier uh, screening uh, and diagnosis of Pompeii in Canada, have often heard people saying whether there's a mental health impact or is there an ethical dilemma when you deliver news of uh, Pompeii disease, especially for someone who would be more of a late onset Pompeii disease patient? Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Oh, this is a really good question. And in fact, um, there is a paper that has come out, you know, which talks about the perceptions or the viewpoints of families and how this news is delivered. Because sometimes it's just told that the individual has or the baby has Pompeii without any other information. And then many families go to Dr. Google and what you see is IOPD and you know the challenges associated with it. So I think that's another learning is of messaging, um, you know, of tiering what we consider the most high risk, you know, for infantile, and then you know dealing with the late onset, you know, through um, discussion with the pediatrician, through discussion with the geneticist, etc., so that families can have this in perspective. And in fact, um, empowering them that this is information. It does not mean, um, you know, that the baby is going to succumb to Pompeii or this is a life-threatening emergency. So that is clearly important. But my other message is we should not be messaging, oh, it's a mild disease and, you know, go away and come back later, much later in life. Because the whole purpose of newborn screening is to intervene at the right time. And I hope with what I showed you here, this was really an eye opener for us of what are these subtle findings that we are seeing. It doesn't mean that if you have these subtle findings that a baby needs to be treated with enzyme therapy, physical therapy can be used as a medium, et cetera. But then at least if you follow these children appropriately, there could be that right time uh, and not have that diagnostic delay that you know I showed you from the registry which were all clinically identified cases where the delay was upwards of like 12 years. 
that actually remind me there is a question and now this is for adults with Pompe disease whether there is any evidence they were surprised or they were interesting uh, to see the piece around physical therapy so is there any evidence on something like a myozyme plus physical therapy or exercise in terms of the benefits achieved. Um, right now, adults in Canada, when they are looking for rehabilitation, physiotherapy, it's likely out of pocket costs or through private health care um, insurance. So uh, most often it's not accessed. I see. That is very unfortunate because if you think about the cost of enzyme therapy and the cost of PT, the two don't, you would just uh, maximize the impact of enzyme therapy. And so I really want to re-emphasize that enzyme therapy is one component of care and the role of diet, the role of exercise, uh, both skeletal muscle, breathing muscle exercise, all of these really play a very important role in the overall management of someone with Pompe disease. And so um, as far as the role of PT during the infusion, there are some data which have shown, and it kind of makes sense, right? You're using the blood, um, the blood stream, you know, to deliver the enzyme. And so if you can have more efficient delivery of blood supply at the time of enzyme, you're getting more of it to where you would like it to be. And so by exercising muscles, and uh, some of our uh, patients are on a, an exercise bike, the children, many of them have it on their backpack and they're doing their regular stuff. So uh, I would definitely suggest uh, working it. And I think Dr. Mark Tanapowski in your group definitely has advocated for it. Uh, and so I think that should be. But the role of PT is not just at the time of enzyme therapy. I think it's also to prevent contractures. It's for muscle strengthening, for, you know, for um posture, for alignment, for use of uh, devices that would help the individual. Um, and I think the other component of um, physical therapy um, is to assess how the patient is doing on enzyme therapy, right? So that then we can advocate, does this patient need more or is the patient in some stage of decline or plateau? You know, the patient voice is important, but often insurance needs documentation of what is going on. And so I have used that, you know, to increase the dose of enzyme. I have used it, you know, to even understand, oh, is this due to an immune response that's going on? So I cannot state enough the important role of physical therapy here. Very good. That, that is great. Another question here is typically whenever uh, a baby or is identified with uh, Pompe through newborn screening in the US, how are they then monitored for um, effectiveness of treatment or therapy? So if they're not walking yet and there's no six minute walk test, what types of measures are used to de determine efficacy? Absolutely. So um, our group has recently published the first paper on this on um, what we look from a physical therapy perspective, right? You can use functional measures. Um, it's difficult to measure strength, right, in a baby, but you can look at posture. And those were some of the pictures I showed you. Those are what we call kinematics. And so a good neuromuscular PT can, you know, observe those, uh, can observe tendencies, can observe, you know, how the baby's rolling, you know, whether the baby has a consist, a, a, a main, um, a head lag, which has persisted, which should have gone away. Are the motor milestones coming in a little later than they should have? Um, those are one set of things that we do. Uh, we also look at the biomarkers. And more recently, uh, we have been looking at muscle ultrasound, you know, using different muscle groups uh, to try and get a better understanding of um, what could be involved by looking at the uh, what we call echo intensity of the muscle and using a quantitative way to look at this echo intensity so we can track each baby um, over time. So these are just the beginnings. Great. I think there's a lot to be done still. That is great. That is great. Um, you know what, actually, let's end off on a comment here. And I actually got two comments like this. These are from parents who have children with um, Pompe disease and saying they wish for others to receive an earlier diagnosis. One parent is commenting here that they took articles to their own doctor to say that I think it is Pompe disease or this is how it should be managed. Another saying it would have saved me a lot of headache and money and stress if I received an earlier diagnosis. So with that, I think we can 
clearly see the evidence, the scientific evidence in terms of the benefits of earlier diagnosis coupled with earlier treatment, whether that be a drug, a therapy, um, rehabilitation, but also from a psychosocial impact as well and from health related quality of life when we think about that piece as well. Absolutely. Yeah. And if there's anything we can do and provide any kind of data or uh, another voice, um, we've done it actually for different states in the U U.S. as well, where some states were initially thinking of a cutoff where, you know, they would not miss infantile, but there was a potential to miss late onset. And we actually advocated. Um, um, and I, I, I think we did the right thing there. Absolutely, absolutely. So we're hoping to invite you back whenever we can proudly say that Canada is on board for screening or has the right interventions and strategies in place to um, assist with diagnosing Pompeii earlier and really appreciate your time, your presentation today. And thank you to all of those who commented and sent in questions and your attention to today's webinar. On behalf of Muscular Dystrophy Canada, thank you for joining and we hope you have a good rest of the day. Thanks thank everyone. You. Thank, thank you. you.